Chairman, thank you. I, I would note that President Biden's EIA numbers for the next 30 years show that oil and gas usage worldwide will continue to increase past 2050. Uh, that even President Biden's numbers from his administration as they look at oil and gas usage and the importance of oil and gas for the next 30 years list globally, we're going to continue to need more oil and gas. So I'm grateful that companies are still exploring, that are still taking the risk, that are still trying to be able to find capital when people are being squeezed out from capital because quietly the administration is saying, we need more, we need more because the world needs more, but publicly they're saying, we need less, we need less, we need less. Uh, so at some point, we've got to address that double speak in the middle of this. Dr. Foss, you made an interesting statement at the beginning of this. Uh, you ended your opening testimony with, we have to remember we need to put materials first. Can you expand on that some? Well, I want to, again, su support another witness here. Um, Jonathan's point about um, th the amount of effort that it's going to take to do something like um, put electric vehicles on the road. Um, this, this all of the above portfolio or idea that, that people walk around with is very uneven. Um, there are pieces of that that are going to take a very long time to do. Um, there are some things that might take a little bit um, less time, but generally speaking, we're talking about really, really large changes. We need supporting infrastructure. To put an electric vehicle together, you have to have the raw materials coming into the manufacturing processes to be able to do that. You have to be able to source them. As I said, they have to be the right quality. When you make batteries, purity is a really big deal. Um, you have to be able to deliver them cost effectively. Um, before the run-up in nickel prices this week, automakers were already worried about the cost of nickel. $30,000 a ton and everything looks different. Um, when you're trying to manufacture EVs. Same thing with copper, with, with um, aluminum, with manganese, with cobalt, you name it. There are like 30 different minerals um, and those associated industries and processes that we have to pay attention to, uh, which you, really complicates the picture when, it does. And you know, you, we're you talking about oil and petroleum fuels and refining seems so simple in right. comparison, and, and they're complicated enough. So... You have to be able to charge EVs. You have to have a power grid to support charging of EVs. If you want to use electric vehicles for demand response, for storage, you have to be able to have the equipment to do that. Um, people have to know how to use the vehicles. Um, there's a whole host of things that has to happen to be able to make it worse for work. But if you can't get the materials, you're never going to get there. Right. So materials policy is the first place to start. And we've already seen China use their uh, ability to be able to limit access to resources to Japan, to Australia. To, they'll, they'll cut off a country if they decide they don't like a country at that point. We are extremely vulnerable. Uh, the more dependent we are on any other nation uh, for our energy production, uh, to be able to make sure that our energy is such that if a nation decides they're going to be upset with us, especially a communist country, or an authoritarian government like Russia is, that if they decide they're in a bad mood that day and they murder their neighbors or they cut off people in the supply chain just because they can, Most that cuts off America. Most of the minerals that we rely on, sir, come from fragile states that we have no ability to deal with, we have no proper responses for, um, we don't engage with them, they're very difficult to engage with, um, and, and uh, trying to influence them in their actions, trying to bring them into the global community is very, very difficult. Thank you. Mr. Sirtis, I, I want to ask you about um, crude coming from the Gulf. Uh, if we're replacing Russian crude or Venezuelan or Iranian or whatever it may be, there's a lot of conversation about heavy crude versus light sweet. Light sweet that we're often getting in the United States uh, on land. In the Gulf, we're getting more heavy crude. Can we supply what we need uh, for the blending that's uh, asked for for our refineries from what's coming from Canada, Mexico, and our own Gulf if we actually tap into those resources? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, across the U.S., there is a, a, a variety of different types of crude that we can um, process in our refineries. Um, currently, the setup that we have right now is for the types of supplies that those refineries and, and, and those manufacturing facilities have been geared to process. There are changes that can be made within that, but there's an important piece of being able to move product around the country more easily that will help in aid in that, that total situation. And, and maybe just to come back to a, a question that you asked around um, the need to continue to pre produce more 
oil and gas, and, and specifically with strong demand needs beyond 2050. I think within that, there's an important part to remember that carbon capture sequestration and how we take the carbon that will be um, emitted from production and use of oil and gas, which there are many needs that, that exist beyond just combustion in a car, many products that we're right. going to need for the future. We need to make sure that we're, that is a, a robust um, piece of, of policy that we have and that we have the tools in place, not from a technical perspective, because technically we know how to do it. This is more from, from the, the land usage and, and overall how the system works and that it can be incentivized to make sure that consumers are acting in a way that is consistent with reducing our need on oil and gas. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would just make one comment to our committee as a whole. Six years ago, we as a Congress voted to allow the export of natural gas. This industry that we have, the exporting, is only six years old. It's very, very young in the process. But if we were not exporting natural gas, I cannot imagine what Europe would be facing right now and the pressure they'd be facing right now, well above and beyond what they're already facing with 38% of their natural gas coming from Russia. But if we were not exporting natural gas and we had made that decision six years ago, this day would be even worse than it already is. So I'm grateful that we made that decision. We need to make some more long-term decisions that will help our energy future.